All right, here with Carrie Haig from PGA of America and Heather Daly Donofrio with the LPGA Tour. Thanks for joining us today. Carrie, we'll start with you. We're hearing raves about this golf course, everybody talking about how long and challenging it's going to be. What are your thoughts here on Atlanta Athletic and any tidbits you might be able to give us on some setup ideas? Well, yeah, thank you. It's great to be here at the Athletic Club and uh, Lucas Harvey, the superintendent, and his team have done a truly magnificent job for preparing you know, the golf course in basically perfect condition, but uh, certainly the membership of the athletic club as well, playing from mats for over six weeks uh, prior to the championship is almost unheard of. And uh, I want to thank them publicly for their commitment to showcase what is going to be a truly great championship. And I'm extremely excited to be here uh, to showcase the best players in the world. Um, on a great golf course. So uh, very excited, can't wait for tomorrow and uh, looking forward to a great championship. Absolutely, Heather, I'll ask you something something similar that's been great mm -hmm. with the with KPMG and the PGA America have been doing, bringing us here to Aronimink, to Congressional, um, to Baltus Rawl. What are you hearing from the players and, and from the rules officials about what Atlanta Athletic Club is going to bring mm -hmm. to the competition this week? Yeah, so I mean, KPMG and PGA of America have elevated this championship in absolutely every way, you know, from everything from the amenities for the players the purse, paying, paying for the entry fees, but like most importantly, the venues that they're bringing us to. I mean, if you look all the way back from year one, starting with Westchester, all the way through to Atlanta Athletic Club this week, I mean, players are raving about it. I am so jealous that I am not playing this week. These practice facilities are amazing. Um, I know the course is going to be, be challenging. I've heard the par threes. Um, are going to be some of the key the key holes to for the players to work their way around. I've got all the confidence in the world in Kerry and setting up this golf course, and I know he'll deliver a great championship and a great platform uh, for the players this week. So they're excited. They're also also already talking about congressional next week. Um, but I think it's amazing that the members played on mats uh, for for a couple of we several weeks before here. I mean, it's just a testament to their their commitment and their dedication to the women's game as well. So we're ready for a great week. Awesome. Before we open it up for questions, I'm going to start with you, Heather, and then take it to Carrie. Kind of the qu same question for both of you. But yesterday was announced um, the KPMG uh, Performance Insights and the new stats project that's going to bring these mm -hmm. these new groundbreaking stats to the LPGA Tour. And from a competition perspective, from a player perspective, how will these help players to be able to fine tune their game and then to be able to help organizations that are setting up golf courses to be able to use those stats to help set up the proper golf courses. Mm -hmm. Heather, I'll start with you. Sure. I, I mean, I think it's huge. I think what back when I played, my idea was taking stats as, oh, I hit, you know, I hit 10 fairways, I hit 14 greens, and I only made one birdie. So I obviously didn't hit it close enough to the hole. You know, that was like kind of the extent of the data. So the fact that our players are going to have actual stroke gain statistics, it's going to take us about 20 rounds to get that baseline is amazing. It's just going to help them. You know, knowledge is power. So it's power for the players in their, their performance and insights into their own games and how they compare to other players. It's power for setup committees and it's power for the media. I mean, I know the media has been asking for years, when are we going to get these stats so we can highlight the performance and the athleticism and the skill of our players and really show the world how great they are. And, and that's a key component to it. And also like for the young girls in the game growing up right now, if they're keeping their own strokes gained and their own stats, they're comparing themselves to the men's stroke gains. And so now that they're now that these young girls are going to be able to compare themselves against the best players in the world on the female side. So it's it's nothing but positives across the board. And we're we're super excited about it. Carrie, yeah, what are your I thoughts? can yeah, agree totally <laughs> with what Heather said. It, you know, the more information you have, the better it is for all of us. And, you know, there's a lot of hearsay of what players hit, how far they hit it, you know, what clubs they're hitting. And the more information that, you know, the world has, uh, spectators, television, media, players, caddies, everyone. It can only help benefit uh, women's golf. So uh, I'm truly excited about it as well. And can't one, wait to, to hear more. One final question for you, and then we'll open it up. You're the one who's going to be setting up the golf course out there. I'm not asking you to tip your hand. But what do you think are some of the challenges that are particularly going to be presented to the players this week um, out there on this course? I think the course offers, uh, it, it's very exciting actually to set it up because there are so many really, really difficult golf shots that you have to play. You know, and you go down the back nine, the second shot into 11, water immediately on the right. The 12th hole, if we make that reachable on any day, water right up to the green. Uh, fifth, 
15, probably one of the hardest par threes in, in golf anywhere, you know, 200 plus yards, downhill, water immediately off the side of the green. 17, a short par three, water. And 18, if, you know, if that becomes reachable, water. So you've got six holes there on the back nine where you have to hit a really good shot, you know, ideally to the safe part of the green to, to be able to play. And that's, you know, the PGA Championship when it was here, we had winners hitting in the water on 15, but still, you know, coming back, making birdies. So I certainly hope and excited to see it'll happen uh, here this week. And then the front nine, you know, we, we built a tee on hole six to make that a drivable par four. Uh, so all of those factors is just good. I can't wait to uh, see what the best players in the world are going to, how they're going to play, because you've really got to think on those and every hole. Love it. Really looking forward to seeing it. We'll open it up for questions. We'll start on the end with Karen, Doug. I'm kind of curious on what you just touched on. When you when you have um, potentially reachable holes or, or moving some tees forward on, on, say, 18 or the par fives, what's your philosophy on, on when it's best to do that? Do you like to see it more on a on a Saturday moving day type thing, or do you think better for the final round? Or what, what's, your, what's your thought on that? Well, in some ways, Doug, here we're sort of spoiled for choice because there are, you know, three, four, or five holes where you can do it. So I think it's sort of, you don't really want to do it all on the same round or all on the same day. So weather related, so what direction the wind is, all those factors have to come into it and, you know, creating a variety. But, you know, there are also good holes from the tees where they are measured from now. So. You know, 18 is a, is a good three shot at par five from the 5.30 tee. But, you know, if you do move it up, it's, it's truly one of the scariest second shots. Oh, tee shots as well, because playing it up, the, you've got the water on the left and the bunkers on the right for the tee shot, and then a force carry for the second. So, uh, I think variety and, you know, how it feels on the day. You didn't answer the read, read between the lines there. Where's the tee going to be Sunday on 18? <laughs> He's not going to tip his hand on that. What's the weather going to be? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff and then Bethany and then down to Fawn. Carrie, just how, how uh, far is that tee on six, the new tee that's built? What is uh, depending where the hole is, but it's about 240, 250 yards. 250. So, again, I think one of the things that I hope to do, or, you know, if you make it reachable or make a par five reachable, our hope is that the majority of the field have that choice or have that decision to make. Um, you know, you're not just necessarily favoring it for the big hitters or what have you. So, uh, yeah, but it's about 240, 250, depending on the hole. But then I actually want to ask about adding a T as well. How often do you do that going into a major? And obviously, you have to work with the club <laughs> to add the T. Can you tell us how that process? comes about and, and how often you've done that? Uh, great question. How often do we do it? Uh, not that often, to be honest, um, as, as we as we don't for the PGA Championship. I think, you know, in most cases, there is a tee usually available or there if the hole makes sense to do it on. And uh, the PGA Championship on hole six, uh, there was a tee for the men's PGA Championship, but I felt it was important that we had one for the women's PGA PGA, so uh, the KPMG, and uh, so when I was here uh, 18 months ago, we talked about it and shared with the club, and you know they were excited because they'll be able to use it for their membership uh, day in day out, and it certainly uh, it makes you think. You know, do you lay up short of the lake, which is really not much club at all? Do you, or do you go for it? There's plenty of room to the right to bail out, but then it's a really tough chip if you do miss it right, mm. but obviously you're rewarded with a birdie or eagle if you're straight. So it, it should be fun to watch and uh, we'll see. Well, thank you. Fun. So, so in the past, when the, when the women's majors started going to historic venues, there was kind of the temptation to make it, the setup too easy for them. And then it turned out that they could hit it longer and more precise than it was expected. So how do you prevent that? How do you set up to the level of the women really and not make it too easy compared to the men, no? So, yeah. I don't. I don't think we've changed how we set it up for all of the seven that I've been involved with. Yeah. Um, you know, they're the greatest players in the world, and yeah. uh, you know, we set the courses up accordingly. We don't try and change each course. You know, each course we played has been so different. Westchester Country Club so different from Sahali that was tree lined and 
Olympia fields with great greens complexes and here. So each course is different. Each yeah. has been, a, you know, sort of round about, you know, 65, 6,800 yards or thereabouts. And, you know, it's each, we look at each specific hole and try and make it bring out, you know, the bunkering or the penalty areas that are in the landing areas and make it so it's a great test for the best players in the world. And that's what we do everywhere, yeah. men or women. So yeah. really no different than we've ever done. So, and if the stats show, the new stats show that the women are better than the men inside 100 yards, <laughs> will you have to make it harder for them around the green zone? <laughs> that, that's all hole locations and uh, there'll be plenty of difficult hole locations, I yeah. would imagine. Uh, they usually are. Okay, thank you. And a weird one Doug. for Kerry. <laughs> When's the last time you played this course? Uh, the last time I played was probably eight or ten years ago. That was kind of what I was curious about. As you're setting it up and, and preparing months in advance, do you ever find yourself needing to, to play it yourself? Uh, I love to walk around and focus on what it is that I'm looking at and doing. Uh, I put the greens, you know, 20 times, you know, during the week and advanced week. So I, uh, I'm feeling it and I'm touching it. If I do I play it? No, I, I love it when I do. Who, who wouldn't love playing these great golf courses? But to focus on, you know, the landing area with sort of the fairways, the greens, how they're playing, and I can watch the best players in the world do it rather than me try and struggle and do it. So <laughs> I can see how the ball reacts and uh, where they're landing, so I can learn just as much from watching than, than uh, slogging it around. Gotcha. Jeff, go ahead. For, uh, for both of you, uh, obviously you have a, a membership here that's committed to having great championships, but I was curious to know your initial reaction when you heard the members were out here playing on mats. Oh, I, I mean, I, I, I actually said, really? Yeah. <laughs> the, and then I heard that they did that when the men were here and that the, the membership was really committed to doing whatever they did when the men were here, they wanted to do it for the women. Um, and I just, I, I think that's amazing. I mean, it, I mean, just look around. This place is gorgeous and everything the food service has been terrific players are raving about it but you know it does it you you want the membership to be vested in the event and and that's part of what it makes it special yeah. and the players can feel that carrie i yeah, know they, I, they do that at open championship venues right once in a while but is it have you experienced it here in these championships very rarely and as heather said the the, the commitment from this club it's in the dna they as their history shows, they hold great major championships and they're proud of their, what I think is one of the best country clubs in the country, without doubt. You know, their facilities, you know, indoor, outdoor tennis, 36 holes golf, the state of the art athletic center, anything and everything. So, you know, but at the same time, that, you know, huge numbers are volunteering here for the championship and, you know, the commitment on the, on the golf of playing off mats is incredible. And, uh, uh, with a, a great staff that we work with, it, it, it's it's so exciting to be here. Can I just test your memory here? Do you remember where the tee was when it was drivable for the men? How far it played? I think it was two uh, two eighty or two ninety. Okay, it was a third of yeah. And Back that tee still down. there. Sorry. Back Heather, down I don't down. know if you could answer this one or not, but I'd I'd, I'd, be, try. I'd be curious if you heard from any of the uh, of the players when we go to certain venues, whether it's U U.S. Open or, or PGA. Um, whether they bother looking at any YouTube clips of, of past majors that were played there. Oh, you, I bet they do. I can't imagine that they don't. I mean, I would if I was if I was playing. I mean, you always you always want to see how certain golf courses play, how the ball. You know, if it was especially if it was the same time of the year, maybe how the ball was reacting on the fairies or the greens. Certain hole locations they might take a look at um, just to get a feel for the course, especially if they've not been here. Because if we're playing back to back weeks, they're not going to get as many looks at the venue as they would, they would want to for a major championship. So I have no doubt that there are players looking at clips on YouTube. And do you, on that, on that note, do you guys still have the, the policy where you can't um, come take a look at the course in advance? We do, we, we've got, we, actually we've loosened it quite a bit. They can do it on the weekend um, ahead, but we, we try to protect the current week sponsor, mm -hmm. just like we would for KPMG this week for VOA um, next week. So we do have some parameters around which they can advance practice, but it's a, they can come any time that the club will allow other than the week before, every day the week before, so. Could they come two weeks before? Sure. Okay, just Absolutely. not the week before, I didn't realize mm -hmm. that, okay. Yeah. Over here, Juan. So with the introduction of rangefinders this week, and uh, you have the experience of Kiwa, uh, I don't know, 
what was the data from Kiwa, how much they were used then, and how much do you expect the women to use the range finder this week? Yeah. You want to address well, so, Sure. Well, we were, as you know, we brought in the use of uh, distance measuring devices at all our spectator championships this year, which uh, the PGA Championship, the Kitchen Aid Senior PGA Championship, and now here at KPMG mm -hmm. Women's PGA Championship. We have been using them at our member championships and our other events for a number of years prior to that. Uh, so there was a lot of discussion, I think, going into both uh, KitchenAid and the PGA Championship. But I think once the both championships got going, it was sort of just business as usual. The players and the caddies are d using them today and day in, day in, out. Mm -hmm. So uh, very little feedback, to be honest, once we got into competition with them. and. Uh, I think they were well received, and you know, uh, we saw a number of players using them. Uh, you know, the champion of the PGA was using them mm -hmm. on the final round. So we are very happy at how it was received and how they're being used. Yeah, and I think I mean I think some players will use them. Some won't. You know, I've heard some cat some players say, "Well, my caddy's going to use it, but I'm not." But it's something that, uh, from an LPGA perspective, we've been talking about for a long time to implement the use of distance measuring devices. Carrie and I have spoken about it for a while as well. Um, and you know, technology is changing in the world of golf, and it's a you know it's another it's another tool in the bag for the players. We've been using them on Symmetra Tour and LET Access Series since the start of 2020. Um, we've used them for local qualifiers or, or qualifying schools. So this was kind of the natural el evolution to then roll them out on L LPGA Tour as well. So this is the first week uh, for us using them as well, and then we're going to continue moving using them um, moving forward at most all of our events. Any Heather, effect, oh, sorry, Jeff yeah. and then Doug. Just any effect, good or bad, on pace of play? What, what have you learned to the first couple? To be honest, it's tough to tell because we haven't played there for 10 years, you know, and there's weather, wind, there are so many other factors. Yeah. I do personally think long term, when players are really used to it, that mm -hmm. it may save a little bit of time. Certainly the shots that are out of the fairway and wide, right. I think in its early infancy, they tend to, you know, use the de measuring device mm -hmm. and the yardage book just to double check. But at some point, I think it may help. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And and you know, that's uh, kids are growing up using them now. So my daughter is playing high school right. golf. She doesn't even know what a yardage book is. <laughs> she doesn't know how to walk off a sprinkler head because she's got her distance measuring device to take her yardage. So I mean, I think that's we're just going to see over time in the future. I don't know what the future of yardage books is, but I think it's just going to become more and more common to use the devices. And I do think it over time, once everybody gets used to their new routine, that it could help on a pace of play perspective. But that's not the ultimate reason for doing it. It's just the game is changing, technology is changing, and our players use them every other time they hit a shot, except when they're in competition. But they will now. Doug? Real, realizing you're working with, with other organizations too, but would you like to see a little more separation between um, your last two domestic majors? Oh I, think anytime, oh, I think anytime we can, you know, schedule, as you know, with a tour, scheduling is the most difficult part of, of, of putting a, a, the tournament season together. And it's dependent upon our, our partners, uh, you know, with KPMG and, and all of our other major partners and availability of golf courses and time of year. I mean, in an ideal world, would we space out our majors a little bit better? I think, yeah, that would be the ideal. But we, we love where they are in the schedule now. We love the venues that we're playing. Um, and they're all, all great championships. Anything further? Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, you know, Heather, as a, as a past player, carry in your role for three plus decades what, what are your thoughts on the green books and you know, there's a lot of talk that these are going to go away but what, what's your general thoughts on the use of them yeah so i, I mean i've been reading the same reports that everybody's uh, been reading the last week we're currently discussing it with our rules team and with our players so ultimately it's going to be a conversation uh, with our members and with our athletes on kind of their perspective on the greens reading materials and I, where we net out on it from an lpga perspective i can't I don't know that because it'll be, you know, series of conversations. We'll see what the USGA and the RNA come out with moving forward, and um, we'll just continue the dialogue and see where it takes us. Right. Yeah, I think it's, uh, as Heather said, the USGA and the RNA uh, are talking about it, and the PGA Tour are talking about it. Uh, if you're a player, absolutely, you're going to use it if it's legal. So. Um, and a lot of players do. Uh, I do think it affects the pace of play negatively. Um, and 
but we'll see. We'll certainly follow or abide by whatever the decision makers make. And uh, you know, if, if a local rule is made available, we'll certainly look at it and consider it. Does it cut into the art of golf, kind of the, the creativity and what a player sees? And To my mind, it certainly, yeah, it takes some of the skill of reading a green, which is a very difficult skill. Um, and I think players, I've heard players say that, so. But. Yeah, I think some players like them, some players don't. I can't even read a greens book, so I can't make heads or tails of it. Can you read greens? Yes. Okay. <laughs> very well. Very <laughs> Last question, Doug. Jeff's question made me, made me think. When you guys um, made the decision to go with rangefinders, how much discussion, if any, did you have with the USGA and RNA who don't allow them at their championships to say this is what we're going to do? And did you get any feedback, or did you just make the decision on your own? Uh, we, we talked uh, internally, and our board talked about it, and uh, we sort of discussed or, or informed the other organizations that we were thinking about it. and sort of ahead of time uh, so that, you know, they were not surprised and they knew about it. Um, and then, you know. Any of them put up a fight? We had some comments um, and some were, you know, good for you and you know, see how it goes and we may look at it and others were maybe not as. The negative ones weren't said. <laughs> Carrie, you could give a master class in diplomacy. Um, I'm going to close with one final question for Heather. And, and Carrie, if you want to jump in, I'm just asking about the Olympics. This is the last mm -hmm. week before the cutoff for, for, team, for all the teams um, for the women's games. Heather, you were at Rio a couple years ago. We're mm -hmm. hearing so many good comments from players who are excited to go. What do the Olympics mean to women's golf? I know you're closely involved with the IGF um, in bringing the, ga uh, the game of golf back to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great. That's another, another project Carrie and I work on together. <laughs> so we're tied at the hip on that one as well. I mean, I think just golf golf in the Olympics is just huge for the game. I mean, if you ask young kids, even, you know, boy, young boys or young girls, you know, what are the four major championships or five major championships on the women's side? They may be able to name one or two, um, but they all know what the Olympics are. And so, you know, uh, as a young child, knowing that they could maybe win an Olympic medal in golf is just huge for the group of the game because because young kids can connect to the Olympics and everybody knows what it is. And, you know, it just provides such a tremendous platform for our players. Um, and, you know, Commissioner Rowan used to say, well, you know, tune into the Olympics this week. But the, the good news is you can you can see this. You can see the same players, you know, 34 other times of the year because we pretty much have the Olympics uh, size field, you know, type field in our in our tour events uh, every week. So I know our players are excited about it. I know, um, you know, a couple of teams are really tough to make uh, Team USA and Team Team Republic of Korea. Um, they're all jockeying for position and lots of points on the line this week uh, for the world ranking. So a um, lot a lot of good buzz around uh, Tokyo for sure. Awesome. Uh, I, I totally uh, repeat what Heather said. I am on, firstly, I'm honored to be a part, a very small part of the sort of the IGF and the, involved in setting up the golf courses for both the men and the women. And that is an honor for the PGA of America to be involved. And for me personally, it's sort of a pinnacle of a career to be involved in, you know, only the second time golf has been in the Olympics. So that is a true honor, uh, but for the players, I think to pl be an Olympian, to win a, try and win a gold medal, and someone was saying the other day, you know, every time, I think it's Justin Rose is announced as an Olympic gold medal winner, and forever, and it's, well, I've won all these other championships, but there's only Justin Rose being currently the only male, and same with the ladies, mm -hmm. if you're an Olympian, and the experience is just so exciting. You know, I watched the swimming trials on last weekend after the golf and it, it just it's so exciting to be an Olympian and uh, to, for golf to be in it is is great and awesome. uh, hopefully it showcases this great game to other others in the world that don't experience it mm -hmm. other than every four years well we're excited to see what what this event means to those games thank you guys so very much appreciate your time huh <laughs> I suppose <laughs> oh gosh what was your Olympic dream as an eight-year-old oh I was a swimmer so it was, you know, it was swimming in the Olympics. Didn't make it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. But I, I honestly, if I, my mom was born in Ireland. So had, the, had we had the Olympics when I played, I was considering getting my Irish uh, citizenship so I could potentially play for Ireland. Because we had some swimmers that 
had dual citizenship and they you know they weren't going to make team usa but they could play for their other country oh. or other countries so no no i just uh Great story. Yeah. <laughs> i love it didn't quite make it <laughs> No, I never. I couldn't make. I couldn't make the Olympics in swimming in any country. <laughs> but I might have had a shot at golf. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Harry, who set up Rio?